Mexico was the first Latin American country where the old oligarchic order was definitively overthrown. And for that reason, it was also the first country in the region that had to grapple with the dilemmas over what would come next. Looking back on this history a hundred years later, it is easy to become cynical over the fact that the revolution leads to the longest lasting authoritarian regime in Latin American history. But there was nothing inevitable about the rise of the PRI. And the idea that the country would soon be living under hegemonic party rule would have sounded truly absurd to most of the activists and soldiers who had participated in the revolution. During the immediate aftermath of the revolution, Mexico had a vibrant multi-party system that offered Mexican workers and peasants an unprecedented voice in the halls of power. In this video, we are going to dwell on this first decade after the revolution in order to understand why this multi-party system ultimately failed and why so many leaders of the revolutionary generation saw one-party rule as a solution to the challenges that Mexico faced. I am not going to go through all of the details of the Game of Thrones that is the Mexican Revolution, since you can find that material elsewhere. But the short version is that the dictator Porfirio Diaz is overthrown by a revolutionary coalition led by the former opposition presidential candidate Francisco Madero. Madero is elected president in 1911, but he himself is assassinated in a military coup just over a year later. Many of Madero's former followers launch a new uprising that topples this military government, but this revolutionary coalition quickly fractures. The constitutionalist faction led by Benustiano Carranza ends up in control of most of the country, and Carranza is elected president in 1917. But he still faces challenges from other revolutionary groups, along with counter-revolutionary forces that seek to restore the old order. Carranza's government manages to defeat all of these rebel groups by 1919, but the constitutionalist faction splits apart and Carranza is overthrown by a coalition led by his former allies, Álvaro Obregón and Plutarco Calles. Obregón and Calles face further challenges during the 1920s, but they manage to defeat them and they hold on to power throughout this decade. So in the end, most of the major revolutionary figures are dead by the mid-1920s, and the only group left standing is a sub-faction of the constitutionalist coalition known as the Sonorans, which is led by Álvaro Obregón and Plutarco Calles. Mexico began holding nationwide elections again in 1917, while this fighting was still going on. And so the constitutionalist activists quickly had to confront the problem of building viable political parties in a country that had no history of regular mass participation in elections. Very little of Mexico's traditional 19th century party system survived into the 20th century. The Conservative Party had collapsed following the overthrow of the Second Empire in 1867, and the Liberal Party had weathered under the Porfiriato. By the time of the revolution, some people in Mexico still identified as liberals, including many of the constitutionalists who won the revolution. But there was no effective liberal party organization that the revolutionary generation could reappropriate. And instead, the revolutionary activists had to construct entirely new parties from scratch. The first of these parties was the Liberal Constitutionalist Party, which was founded by constitutionalist activists for the purpose of supporting Carranza's 1917 presidential campaign. After Carranza was overthrown, Obregón gains control over this party organization, and it becomes the main partisan bulwark for his presidency in the early 1920s. Many of its organizers had hoped that the Liberal Constitutionalist Party would become the singular party of the constitutionalist movement that won the revolution. 
However, this party never develops much of a mass base, and its core constituency was always the constitutionalist military establishment. The main opposition party during the early 1920s was the National Cooperative Party, which originally defended a fairly radical economic program of nationalizing all of the country's land and industries and reorganizing them as cooperatives. However, this party quickly develops a mostly urban middle class electoral base, and its attention turns away from economic redistribution and towards democratization, education reform, and weakening the power of the military. The main party that represents the interests of the peasants is the National Agrarian Party. The Agrarian Party's leaders come from mostly urban middle class backgrounds. But this party is one of the strongest parties in rural areas in the early twenties. Although the urban working class did not play a major role in the combat during the revolution, the labor movement in Mexico City had been a key base of support for the governments of Carranza and Obregón. In 1919, the country's largest labor federation. The Regional Confederation of Mexican Workers, or the CROM, founds a new party called the Mexican Labor Party, which was arguably the first electorally significant labor-based party in Latin America. The Labor Party was always strongest in Mexico City and other urban areas, but it soon begins organizing in rural areas as well, and it emerges as Mexico's strongest party by the mid 1920s. While all of the parties that I just listed were Mexico's main national level parties, the country had also developed over a hundred regional and state level parties. The most important of these regional parties was the Socialist Party of the Southeast, which was structured as a federation of state level socialist parties in the Yucatan Peninsula and Chiapas. The Socialist Party of the Southeast was built upon a mass movement in southeastern Mexico, based on a series of popular organizations called resistance leagues. The resistance leagues were founded by small groups of citizens in both urban and rural areas. Some of the leagues organized within a particular place of work, and they came to carry out many of the functions of labor unions. Other leagues took the form of mass-based political clubs that focused on political issues such as women's suffrage, while many of the leagues in rural areas focused on establishing peasants' cooperatives. The resistance leagues were formally separate from the Socialist Party of the Southeast, but the party is nevertheless able to direct this mass movement through the Liga Central. And the resistance leagues form the bulk of the Socialist Party's mass support. Finally, Mexico also has a Communist Party by the 1920s, but it is still a very small party throughout this decade, and it does not become a major force in the Mexican labor movement until the 1930s. Mexico's governing coalition goes through a number of changes during the early 1920s. The victors of the revolution, the Sonoran leaders Obregón and Calles, are always in power throughout this decade, but they do not have a single reliable party that can provide a stable majority in Congress, and they end up having to form a series of ad hoc alliances with several different parties. During the early years of Obregón's presidency, the Sonorans rely mostly on the liberal constitutionalist party. For congressional support, but in 1922, a progressive opposition bloc led by the National Cooperative Party gains a majority in Congress. This upset leads the Sonorans to sever their ties with the liberal constitutionalists and form a new governing alliance with the three main opposition parties: the Cooperative and Agrarian Parties and the Labor Party. This new governing alliance is symbolically important because each of these parties represent a different segment of the revolutionary populist coalition of the middle class, the urban working class, and the peasantry. 
Although this particular alliance of parties does not last long, we are going to see this populist coalition between the middle class, working class, and peasants reemerge in a very different form in our next video. And it will continue to be the main base of support for Mexico's ruling party throughout the remainder of the 20th century. Meanwhile, without the patronage of the government, the Liberal Constitutionalist Party falls into a steep decline and it largely disappears as an effective political force by the mid-1920s. The Socialist Party of the Southeast is not really part of the governing coalition at this time, but it comes to support Obregón and Calles' governments because it recognizes that the survival of its revolutionary project in the Southeast is contingent on having a stable revolutionary government in power in Mexico City. As Obregón's term as president ends and Calles prepares to assume power, Calles decides that he cannot trust the cooperatist party, and so he elevates the Labour Party to a much more prominent place in his government. The Labour Party's founder, Luis Morones, holds the position of Minister of the Interior, Commerce and Labour throughout most of Calles' term as president, and Morones quickly becomes one of the most powerful men in the government. Calles' alliance with the Labour Party ultimately alienates the Cooperative Party, which re-enters the opposition during the mid-1920s. Meanwhile, Obregón gets nervous about the amount of influence that the Labour Party now wields in the government, and he forms a similar alliance with the Agrarian Party in the hope of playing the Agrarian and Labour parties off of each other. By the mid-1920s, the parties of the workers and the peasants have formed the heart of the governing coalition, and their members are occupying high-level positions in the Mexican government. However, these parties quickly discover that they have only a limited influence over Calles and Obregón. Calles' government turns out to be just as conservative on economic issues as Obregón before him, and the idea that Mexico is ever going to undergo a systematic nationwide land reform is becoming increasingly far-fetched by the mid-1920s. For their part, Obregón and Calles have managed to juggle Mexico's main parties in a way that provides them with a secure majority of support in Congress. But these ad hoc alliances are starting to become unwieldy by the late 20s, and the Sonoran leaders are alienating a lot of their former allies in the process. Two major crises in the 1920s demonstrate that the constitutionalist revolutionary movement is not nearly as united as Obregón and Calles want to pretend. First, one of the other main Sonoran leaders, the Minister of Finance Adolfo de la Huerta, is upset that Obregón picked Calles over him to be his successor as president. And in 1923, de la Huerta launches a major revolt against Obregón's government. While this revolt is eventually crushed, it receives a disturbing amount of support from the revolutionary military establishment, along with local revolutionary elites throughout much of the country. The second crisis that the Sonoran leaders face in the 1920s is the succession crisis. In 1924, Obregón had passed the presidency to Calles, but now Calles is reaching the end of his four-year term and it is unclear who is going to succeed him. In 1927, Álvaro Obregón announces that the next president should be none other than Álvaro Obregón himself. But Obregón's decision to run for a second term as president is extremely controversial because the one principle that he united all of the major revolutionary factions from Maderistas and Carrancistas to the Villistas and Zapatistas was the principle of no re-election. For many of the more moderate members of the constitutionalist revolutionary movement, not having personal dictators anymore was supposed to be the entire point of this brutal decade-long civil war, and now Obregón is jeopardizing it. 
It reassures absolutely nobody that Obama Gon took a four-year break from the presidency before running again because the dictator Porfirio Diaz had done the exact same thing right before he established a two-and-a-half-decade-long personal dictatorship that ended only with the Mexican Revolution. For many revolutionary activists, this is a bridge too far. The Socialist Party now passes firmly into the opposition, and it becomes one of the leaders of the anti-re-election movement. The Labour Party reluctantly endorses Obregón, but this decision is resisted by many of the party's lower-level activists, and the Labour Party nearly breaks apart over this decision. Obregón's main challenger in the 1928 election is the revolutionary general and governor of Mexico City, Francisco Serrano. However, nine months before the election in October 1927, Serrano and many other opposition activists are apprehended by the military and executed without trial in the first major wave of mass political assassinations since the revolution ended. The following day, the government also purges 30 anti-re-electionist politicians from the Federal Congress. With the anti-re-electionist opposition crushed, Obregón gets his re-election, but he does it in the ugliest way possible, and he alienates much of Mexico's revolutionary movement in the process. In the end, Obregón never begins his second term as president, because he is assassinated just a few weeks after the election. The assassin is a Catholic activist who ostensibly killed Obregón out of revenge for Caius's anti-clerical policies. However, many people at the time suspected that the Labour Party leader, Luis Morones, was behind this assassination. Whether he believed this conspiracy theory or not, Calles decides to play it safe by purging Morones and his Labour Party from the governing coalition in the aftermath of Obregón's assassination. The assassination of Álvaro Obregón reopens the secession question, but it also convinces Calles that the political situation in Mexico is far too unstable at the moment to allow a genuine electoral contest to choose Calles' successor. With Obregón dead, Calles is now more determined than ever to hold on to power in some way. But after all of the backlash that Obregón just faced when he tried to run for a second term as president, it is also clear to Calles that he is never going to be able to hold the office of president again. And so Calles is going to need to rule Mexico indirectly through a series of puppet presidents who do not have any major political ambitions of their own. But this strategy carries a major risk. Mexico is going to need to hold an election eventually, and the sort of non-entity who makes a good puppet is precisely the sort of candidate who risks losing an election to a popular anticayista revolutionary figure unless he has the support of a strong political party. But by 1928, Calles has pretty much exhausted his supply of political parties that are willing to cooperate with him. The Labour Party had been his main ally throughout most of his presidency, but Calles has just alienated the Labour Party by purging Morones from his cabinet. The other main party in the governing coalition, the Agrarian Party, was always really Obregón's party and its leadership is very hostile to Calles by this point. The Socialist Party of the Southeast is slightly more sympathetic to Calles, but it is a purely regional party that is too small to organize a nationwide presidential campaign on its own. After spending several years in the opposition, the Cooperatist Party is interested in rejoining the governing coalition but this party was traditionally the most staunchly anti-Cayista party, and Calles is not sure that he can trust it. Because none of these parties is a reliable enough electoral vehicle on its own, Calles comes up with the solution of merging them together into a new party that he can control, 
the National Revolutionary Party. Because this new party would gobble up most of Mexico's existing parties, this merger would also have the effect of starving any opposition candidate of the partisan support that they would need in order to run an effective campaign against Caius's candidate. Many of the party leaders and activists push back against this merger proposal, but Caius is ultimately able to convince the parties to go along with it for three reasons. First, Caius makes a compelling case that Mexico's current political system just isn't working, and he reframes the Revolutionary Party as a catalyst that would bring the era of Caudillo politics to an end and create a new Mexico that would be governed by institutions rather than by individuals. Second, there is the fact that this party is probably going to win the next election. For local revolutionary activists who had previously been confined to state-level politics, joining the National Revolutionary Party was a rare opportunity to get included in the governing coalition and thereby gain access to the patronage of the federal government. Likewise, many of the already well-established national parties worried that if they refused to join the National Revolutionary Party, they would be cut off from government patronage for good. The collapse of the Liberal Constitutionalist Party upon its entry into the opposition is still fresh in everyone's memory, and the other party elites want to avoid that fate at all costs. Third, Kayak convinces the parties that they would retain considerable autonomy even after this merger. They would be able to maintain their own headquarters, local party organizations, and resources, and the existing parties would become a sort of subsidiary of the National Revolutionary Party that would nevertheless retain their separate identities as political parties. However, shortly after this merger takes place, Kaye supplements this coalition structure with a much more centralized structure based on a system of national, state, and municipal committees. The National Party organization as a whole remains under the tight control of Caius himself. Many of the municipal committees are controlled by local revolutionary elites, but in most cases they are not spaces for genuine mass participation in party politics. And so the National Revolutionary Party ends up at a rather ambiguous place that reflects the ambiguity of the revolution as a whole in the late 1920s. The unification of Mexico's fractured revolutionary movement behind a single party was a remarkable organizational achievement that resulted in the most broad-based political party that Mexico had seen up until this point. But the Revolutionary Party's mass support is much shallower in practice than its overwhelming vote shares in elections might indicate. The party has the support of the revolutionary activists and the minority of politically active Mexicans, but the majority of Mexico's adult population is politically apathetic and it still lies outside of the electoral process at this time. Although the party's structure is internally democratic on paper, there is no internal democracy in the National Revolutionary Party in practice. Most members of the party have no significant voice in party decisions, and the influence of the unionized working class is especially weak thanks to the intentional exclusion of the Labour Party from this merger. Despite its mass membership base, the National Revolutionary Party has many of the characteristics of an elite party. From the national level down to the municipal level, the party organization is controlled by Mexico's new political class. This is not the same economic elite that governed Mexico throughout the 19th century, but it is a type of political elite that has very different preferences on both economic and social issues compared to the bulk of the Mexican population. Urban workers and peasants had already become frustrated 
by the lack of revolutionary economic reform during the 20s. But Mexico ends up moving in an even more conservative direction under the National Revolutionary Party during the early 1930s.